can horror games really surprise us anymore? Not with a jump scare, that's a different video essay. But after decades of AAA and indie horror games, is there really much left that can come out of left field to reinvigorate the genre? We've done zombies and atmospheric puzzlers, body horror. I mean, what's really left out there? Horror is by no means dead. In fact, we're getting more releases than ever. But with the Callisto Protocol being a surprise disappointment, oh God. and most anticipated horror releases being remakes, it's hard to be taken off guard. And that's when horror games shine, when they do something unexpected. But there was one game I played in 2022 that not only renewed my hope for horror gaming in general, but it also did the impossible. This is how Rose Engine's Signalis perfected Lovecraftian horror. Before we get into the video essay, I just wanted to jump in here and remind you to subscribe and like the video for more content like this every single month. It's free and really helps the channel grow. Thank you so much. There's a lot of media that attempts to adapt the works and ideas of H.P. Lovecraft, but most of it falls short, especially when it comes to video games. One trip into the gaping maw of the Steam search results for the Lovecraftian tag will leave you on the brink of madness. So what makes Lovecraftian horror so difficult to adapt anyway? Well, let's talk about this notorious horror author. Lovecraft may have perfected the cosmic horror genre in his writing, but I think we have to address the big prejudiced elephant in the room here first. He was wildly racist, sexist, and intolerant in many ways. And he was not subtle about it. Like, not even a little bit even within the context of the early 20th century time period. To put it plainly, he was a piece of shit. Lovecraft's most famous stories are all about the fear of the indescribable, the unknown, which is likely why so much of his work upon further inspection veers into xenophobic territory. The infamous fishing village of Innsmouth, where the people look like fish? and are untrustworthy with money. Uh, oh right, and let's not forget. Yeah, not, not great. And that's why most people refer to this space in horror as eldritch or cosmic horror instead of Lovecraftian. Listen, the SEO was just better for that phrasing, okay? So apart from the subtle racism and the not subtle at all racism, what was Lovecraft's work about? For the most part, they were horror stories about mankind's insignificance in a bigger cosmic landscape, where aliens and long dormant ancient creatures existed just outside of our perception. Often, his protagonists noticed small details in the world around them seeming out of place, but when they began pulling at the threads of these mysteries, their psyches are what eventually unraveled. When someone gazed at the horrors of the unknowable, their mind shattered, driving them to insanity. But the trick that made most of these stories so terrifying to readers was that they were just that, stories. Stories that were just words on paper. The reader had to fill in the blanks. And apart from a subtle phrase here or there, Lovecraft never went into great detail about what his horrors looked like, sometimes even using contradictions to form convoluted images in the reader's mind. And that's why Lovecraft was often referred to as the next Edgar Allan Poe. His stories made the reader's imagination do the work. So we fast forward about a century with the world undergoing so many unforeseen shifts lately. The fear of the unknown is again ever present in our minds, setting the scene for the modern eldritch boom. And like one of the ancient gods in Lovecraft's stories, his work has always been present in the horror genre with a few rabid devotees. But then, all of a sudden, it has this major resurgence 
especially in video games. But video games by their nature are a very visual medium, making it hard for Lovecraft's manipulation of the reader's mind to really translate. There's a lot of games that attempt the eldritch horror angle without any great payoff really. Slap a sanity meter on the game and you're good to go, right? Populate the world with cultists and maybe throw in a cephalopodic appendage for good measure. But they often miss the point of what made the subgenre appealing in the first place. So what if I told you the best representation of this genre includes none of those classic hallmarks? No octopus limbs, no sanity meters, and no mysterious cults in sight. In October of last year, Signalis really took me by surprise. I was sent a Steam code for it, and at first, I didn't really think much of it. The game was simply described as a classic survival horror experience set in a dystopian future. Like, okay, so it's Resident Evil with androids. Sure, sounded like fun, so I booted it up, and from just Signalis's opening alone, I could already tell this was going to be something special. The metal hallways were cold and uninviting. The station around me creaked and moaned every time I took a step. Sounds were discordant, brooding. Even the menus oozed personality. Chaotic industrial soundscapes and nostalgic piano tracks crafted an atmosphere that I could only describe as sharp. A couple minutes into my time with the game, I came across this doubled over body in an early game corridor and thought, oh, I've played horror games before. That's going to wake up and jump scare me, duh. So I slowly maneuvered around it, holding my breath. But to my surprise, I was safe. The game does this sort of thing a lot, lulling you into a false sense of safety and then, damn it, I knew it. And as I played through more and more of the game, I realized how tense I was all of the time constantly. As I explored, I kept asking myself if I could sneak around enemies or if I needed to use my precious bullets, since there were often just enough to get me through tight spots, but never too many to let me exhale comfortably. I often found myself stopping to take a breath before opening a door and running through a rusty hallway past shrieking undead. The six slot inventory kept me on edge and the puzzles really made me think. Rose Engine definitely got the memo on how to make a heart-pounding survival horror experience, where a lot of their contemporaries haven't. Even some of the genre's bigger players uh, seem to have forgotten what made the genre fun. Signalis is a love letter not just to survival horror classics, but to a lot of horror media, and it wears those influences proudly. The Shining, Ghost in the Shell, Event Horizon, Junji Ito, and most clearly, Lovecraft. But despite all the familiarity you might feel through these references while playing the game, Signalis definitely ensures you're never comfortable for even a moment, even in its more somber ones. You'll feel like you're staring into a chilling, churning pit. Because when I started to try uncovering what was going on in this story, that's where the eldritch influences really came through in full force. While there's enough tangible elements to make you think you know what's going on, Rose Engine will subvert your expectations over and over. There were these moments I felt like I was playing through a fever dream of ominous messages and disturbing visuals, and the story can feel like this ephemeral liquid, always changing and churning and trickling through your fingers when you think you've got a grasp on it. That hazy storytelling added to my unease throughout my time with the game, and the deeper I dove into this world, the less connection I seemed to have to the events transpiring there. Characters I thought were one person are suddenly someone else? It's a hell of a game. Mainly told through scattered notes and very disjointed cutscenes, the plot was, um, experimental. But because the game is often leaning into its surreal nature with full force, it made me pay even more attention to what was happening. I'm going to risk sounding like a million other video essayists here and say it's an experience. Like an A24 art house film you don't fully understand but still feel satisfied by, you know? It made me feel like a conspiracy theorist, stretching yards of red twine between photos tacked up on my corkboard just to keep up. Like 
look at all of these notes I kept during my first playthrough of the game. I haven't taken this many notes while playing a game since I tried to achieve the wisdom ending in Tunic and oh my god. The themes that Signalis had me contemplating were more important than concrete narrative beats though. It's a game about holding on to hope against cosmic odds. About memory. Queer love. The fragility of the human psyche and what it means to exist in the first place are some of the biggest scares of this space colony turned death trap. Signalis hits the nail on the head when it comes to crafting an effective and horrific atmosphere. It's heady and claustrophobic, but spacious in its complexity. And at least throughout my handful of playthroughs, without a single tentacle in sight. It takes everything that Lovecraft's stories explored and polishes them to a modern sheen. When I finished Signalis, my brain was absolutely melting, trying to piece together what had just happened. So I went through my Steam library to look through some other games that tackled the eldritch horror theme. There's so many other games that try to use a similar lens as Signalis when looking to tell a Lovecraft-inspired story, employing much more of the classic eldritch trappings. Ancient gods and indecipherable symbols and cults are a part of the tapestry, sure, but expected visual hallmarks of such a popular genre are just that, expected. So can devs even surprise us anymore? Is it possible to handcraft visuals that both disturb and surprise after we've seen so many iterations of the horror classics? AI generation is often faulty to a hilarious degree. If you ever played around with Doll E Mini to create bizarre collages of grotesque monstrosities, you know this all too well. Faces are skewed and limbs are subtly misshapen in understated ways. These abominations hail from the uncanny valley, something that we assume must have been created by a human, but rather it's made by a machine, doing its best to camouflage itself, acting like one of us. Take something like Source of Madness, a game that gets the vibe and aesthetic of eldritch horror so right through AI generation, but just doesn't quite reach the same heights as Signalis gameplay-wise. They're very different in genre, sure, but I think Source of Madness is a great example that Lovecraftian style doesn't beat out substance, even when that style is some of the best I've seen. It's a shame a game that nails the visual representation of something as amorphous as unknowable Lovecraft monstrosities fumbles when it comes to the actual gameplay. It's pretty repetitive and unremarkable, at least when compared to other Dead Cells adjacent roguelites on the market. Because every creature is randomly generated by AI, they look horrific, but because of that randomness, they also end up moving very cartoonishly? And hey, it made for some very humorous gameplay moments, but Eldritch Horror I, I don't know. And fights often devolve into a mess of kiting and manically pressing buttons until everything is dead. After just a dozen runs, it feels like I saw a majority of what this game had to offer. Limbs everywhere, squelching pustules, and repeating architecture. And all of that bundled together made for an experience that was less unfathomable horror and more disappointing repetition. Playing through the rest of my Steam library's Lovecraftian tag, that's pretty much how I felt about a lot of the games vying for the cosmic horror angle. Not because they're bad games, most of the games I'm showing are actually great. A lot of these games, and even the genres they're in, are set up to fail when it comes to interpreting Lovecraft's stories. A fast-paced action RPG like Bloodborne is amazing, and its unique take on the aesthetics of Victorian meets occult meets alien is really enjoyable, actually. But does it reach those same thematic heights as Signalis does? Although, I will say, there are some great Eldritch Horror-inspired titles on the horizon this year, so let's hope they can satisfy the hunger of the old ones, you know? Yet another thing that made Signalis buoy its way above the inky sea of Lovecraft inspirations 
wasn't just the themes and the way it told its unnerving story. It was the fact that it leaned so decidedly into these faux PS1 aesthetics. There's been this resurgence bubbling up in the indie horror space over the last few years of the PS1 visual style, hearkening back to classics like Silent Hill and the original Resident Evils while introducing modern quality of life upgrades. For a really great in-depth look into this low poly horror revival, I'll link to Pim Script's video on it. Their channel is great and they're an expert when it comes to horror media in my opinion. These low poly horror games reject the most recent trend of making scares dependent on how realistic and immersive something feels, opting to instead find their scares deep in the uncanny valley. And I mean deep. The models and characters in these games feel more like dolls than people. It's less about jump scares and gore, but more about a slow burn. The feeling that something is just a miss. And luckily, there's a lot of examples of this since so many classic horror experiences are getting shiny new remakes lately. Resident Evil 2's remake still delivers on some great scares and gameplay, but for very different reasons than its 1998 counterpart. Now that the modern remakes no longer have to rely on fixed perspectives, the player can look wherever they want, and walking through most doors will no longer play this tension-inducing loading screen. Hiding enemies just out of your line of sight becomes much harder, so the remake needed to be clever and find other ways to get you. There's an unsettling charm to a lot of these classic horror games of the late 90s that kind of evaporated over the decades as graphics improved. Realism isn't necessarily what makes things scary, and imitating the PlayStation's style is all about recreating the system's limitations that lent themselves to making terrifying atmospheres. Most famously, a game like Silent Hill 2 used the town's thick fog to mask the hardware's limited draw distance, and Resident Evil's tank controls were an answer to fixed camera angles to ensure consistent movement throughout rooms with opposing camera angles. And there's other limitations that play into the modern low poly trend success in the horror space too. Those janky movements make every object feel impossibly nauseous. The limited color palette lends everything this muddy and dirty look. Sound is often crunchy and creaks are indistinguishable from enemies moaning. And like a great horror novel, these games give you just enough information and a nudge to let your mind do most of the heavy lifting. I'd argue that the uncanny valley we veer into with these low poly games gives us the same sensation that Lovecraft's stories used to give his readers. We're perceiving something that just feels off in a way that we can't quite explain, but it's unnerving and gets under our skin. These abstractions exist in this liminal space of unsettling polygons. Like, if you asked me to draw you a necromorph from Dead Space, I probably could. I know what it looks like, and for the most part, have a fairly clear idea of their anatomy. But the creatures in Signalis? Apart from their loose silhouettes, I'd be at a complete loss. Had Rose Engine opted for a more realistic portrayal in rendering these monstrosities, I wouldn't be nearly as frightened when they chased me down a hallway for the hundredth time. Even though I've seen them plenty, I don't know what they look like. So in a way, the low fidelity graphical style of the PS1 era look that Signalis is borrowing from is actually the perfect breeding ground for Eldritch Horror. Because like Lovecraft's protagonists, no matter how long I look at this or this, I can't truly wrap my head around it. And that's kind of the whole point. Signalis is a throwback like those I've been showing but taken one step further. It reminds us of the old while remixing a lot of the familiar elements in a really innovative way. Rose Engine is pushing the survival horror needle forward, not just resting on being a callback to the classics we remember. And I think it's the future of the horror genre overall, not just this low poly revival. Eldritch Horror has always been about perspective and perception, and Signalis toys with both of those elements to amazing effect. It's one of those rare games that has stuck with me for a long time after finishing it, 
festering in the back of my mind. There's so many things to praise and to analyze. Signalis' atmosphere is perfectly oppressive. Its old school aesthetics perfectly marry its various themes, just like its story, which felt emotionally moving but at the same time was beyond comprehension for me. Sure, I could have watched a handful of great narrative analysis and ending explained videos on the topic, which are all great and you should check them out, but the eldritch abstraction of what exactly was going on really scratched that heady Lovecraftian itch that so many of Signalis' tentacle-loving counterparts lack. Although Lovecraft definitely used a lot more hitherto's and racism, while Signalis opts for ominously placed German and refreshing queerness. After eight years of working on this passion project of theirs, Rose Engine is redefining how we look at eldritch horror in video games. Not only can it be done well, but it can be... Oh wait, it's just a pew pew space game? Ah, fuck. Hey there, thank you for watching the video essay. I really hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, make sure to give the video a like down below and subscribe to the channel. It really helps the video reach more people. And because I put over 40 plus hours into these video essays every single month, I would super, super appreciate it. Speaking of helping out, these videos are not cheap to produce. So if you believe in the content and wanna see me do this full time, you can always support over on my Ko-fi page. And if you don't know what Ko-fi is, it's basically like Patreon, but a lot cooler. A huge thank you to my monthly supporters over on that Ko-fi page, Voxamandius, Puzzled Monkey Tree, Mumpow, Dear Papaya, Oyster Milk, Nightmare God, Bean Fiello, Velt Walker, Cap Danvers, Robertson, Comrade Quest, Max Wattage, Catdog3000, Lion Bite, Sarah, and John Lax. For as little as $4 a month, you can also become a monthly supporter over on that Kofi page, and you'll get shoutouts at the end here, sneak peeks at future video essays, and some behind the scenes content. Also, if you wanna check out any of the games that I mention in any of my video essays, there are always affiliate links in the description down below. They help the channel and trans charities at the same time, and sometimes they have sales that Steam doesn't even have, so it's worth checking out. Anyway, thank you so much again for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it, and oh yeah, Go share the video!